everybody, and welcome back to See Elise. Today, you're going to see Elise clean and talk about true crime. Welcome back to another episode of Cleaning and Crime. I love to listen to true crime while I clean my house. So because those are my two loves, I've merged the two. And every week I post a new motivating whole house cleaning video while at the same time I sit in a little bubble and I tell you about a true crime case that's interesting to me. So, cleaning and crime. So you'll be seeing me in a time-lapse video cleaning my house to give you some motivation while you hear the crime story of the day. But for some, the cleaning is too distracting or you just don't care for it. Or maybe you just prefer to listen to your crime and not watch it. If that's the case, check out the Cleaning and Crime podcast. You can find it wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And it's just the audio only crime version of the story. Today's true crime case is about Leonardo Cianciulli, an Italian serial killer who made a name for herself by selling her adorable handmade soaps. And that may sound sweet and innocent, but it's super not. Her soaps were made from human flesh. Uh oh. <laughs> It's a wild story, and there is a lot more to it, including cannibalism. So let's get into it. Leonardo Cianciulli was born April 18th, 1894. Oh yeah, we're going way back. In Montella Avellino in Italy. And Leonardo's life started out pretty rough right away. Leonardo is actually a child of rape. And as if that isn't traumatic enough, her mother, Amelia Dinalfi, was a teenager at the time she was raped, and because she became pregnant because of that sexual assault, her family forced her to marry her rapist. Yeah. So Amelia and Mariano, the rapist, got married and started a family so they could raise Leonardo together. Awful. The family was very poor, and they were very religious, and Leonardo was forced to spend a good chunk of her childhood in silence. Like, they frequently took religious-based vows of silence for extended periods of time. That's not for me. Leonardo's father, Mariano, did pass away when Leonardo was pretty young, and Amelia remarried pretty quickly. But that didn't do anything to better their financial situation or better Leonardo's childhood. Amelia was pretty emotionally abusive to Leonardo. And Leonardo suffered from severe depression, and she even attempted suicide twice. So, rough start in life. Leonardo's mother, Amelia, pressured her to marry rich, to try and bring some wealth to the family for once. And Amelia even found a guy who was pretty wealthy and very religious and arranged a marriage for Leonardo. But Leonardo was like, fuck that. She fell in love with this guy named Raffaele Pensardi, and he was quite a bit older than her, and he worked as a registry office clerk. So... Not rich and not religious. And Amelia was pissed. She did not approve of the proposed marriage to Raffaele. So like any mother would do, rather than give her blessing for this marriage, she cursed the couple for all of eternity. Brutal. Now just to make herself feel better, Leonardo decided to see a fortune teller. But that only made her feel worse. This fortune teller told Leonardo that she would get married and she would have children, but all of her children would die, and they would die young. Leonardo and Raffaele got married in 1917 with the belief that bad luck and misfortune were going to follow them wherever they went, so very romantic. In 1921, the couple moved to Loria, which is now Potenza, to find work, but the curse followed. And they really did have pretty bad luck, if you want to call it that. Leonardo became pregnant 17 times throughout her marriage, but three of those pregnancies ended in miscarriage, and 10 of the children died as babies or toddlers. 10. So out of 17 pregnancies, only four of Leonardo's children survived. When they first began having children, Raffaele was struggling financially to support the family, despite him and Leonardo both working. And I don't know the exact details on this, but in 1927, Leonardo was arrested on fraud charges and served a brief prison sentence. When Leonardo got out of prison, the family decided to relocate to Lacedonia for a fresh start. But then, shortly after they got there in 1930, there was a giant earthquake, and 1,400 people were killed, 7,000 were injured, and their home was one of the thousands that were destroyed. So they were forced to relocate again, this time to Correggio. In Correggio, they finally began to feel a bit financially stable, and Leonardo opened up a small shop, and she sold artisanal soaps, among other things, and she actually became very popular in town and was well-respected. And the shop actually became quite popular. 
But the fear of the curse was weighing heavy on Leonarda. And because she had lost 13 of her children, she believed that what that fortune teller years back had told her was true. So to quell her fears, or maybe just to get some extra information, she decided to see another Romani fortune teller, this time that specialized in palm readings, obviously. Now this fortune teller told Leonarda, In your right hand, I see prison. In your left hand, I see a criminal asylum. Well, that wouldn't make me feel better. Now, Leonardo was already extremely superstitious, and she was incredibly overprotective of her four remaining children. And this bad palm reading was just making everything worse, so she confided in this fortune teller and told her that she believed all of the misfortune that she's had in her life was due to her mother's curse. And the fortune teller agreed, and she told her, you know the only way to break a curse such as this? Human sacrifice. Okay. And Leonardo, desperate to turn her luck around, was willing to do whatever it takes. Where did she find this fortune teller? Human sacrifice. It's a great idea. I saw it in the palms. Rural Italy in the 1930s was wild, I guess. In addition to soap making, Leonardo also got into fortune telling and palm reading as well and started offering those services at her shop. And she served as sort of a matchmaker in town because she knew everybody. Soon she had a good reputation and a robust client list, and things were really looking up. But in 1939, World War II had broken out in Italy, and recruiting for the military had begun. And Leonardo's favorite son, Giuseppe, informed her that he was planning on enlisting in the Italian army. Leonardo was devastated, horrified, and incredibly frightened for her favorite son, Giuseppe's safety. And she knew there was only one way to protect him. Leonardo began looking for someone to sacrifice to break the curse and protect her favorite son, Giuseppe, because that makes perfect sense. Then a woman named Faustina Setti came to see Leonardo because Leonardo had been helping Faustina find a man. Every article I read described Faustina as a lifelong spinster. Rude. She was about 50 years old, still unmarried, and she told Leonardo that she didn't want to spend the rest of her life alone. So she was hoping Leonardo, with her matchmaking skills, could help her find a husband. So on this visit, Leonardo picked Faustina to be her sacrificial lamb. And she told Faustina, guess what? I found you a man, girl. He is perfect, but he lives in Palo, which is all the way over in Croatia. So pretty far. You're going to have to move. But... He's hot, he's rich, it's going to be so perfect. Faustina was so excited, she couldn't wait to tell everyone. But Leonardo was like, mm, don't tell anybody yet. Like, it's pretty tacky. Like, that's not how these things are done. You know what we need to do? You need to pre-write letters to your friends and family, telling them where you went, telling them who you married, telling them he's so great, everything is awesome. Leave the letters with me. Then when you let me know that you got there, I'll send the letters for you. You'll save on postage. Like, it's just the way these things are done. Don't even worry about it. I got you, girl. Uh-oh. <laughs> so Leonardo tells Faustina, go home, write your letters, pack your shit, and then when you're ready, come back here to my house, give me your letters, and I'll send you on your way to your new man all the way over in Croatia. It'll be great. So Faustina gets everything ready and goes over to Leonardo's one last time, gives her her everything is so great letters, and Leonardo tells her, okay, wait, before you go... We have to celebrate. Let's have a toast. So she pours some wine, offers a glass to Faustina, and they make a toast to brighter days ahead. But the wine was laced with sedatives. <gasps> and as soon as Faustina fell asleep due to the sedatives in her wine, Leonardo killed her with the blunt end of an axe. Human sacrifice. But that is not all. Good God, that is not all. Buckle up, get ready, trigger warning. Leonardo then dragged Faustina's body into a closet and proceeded to dismember her. And she even saved all of Faustina's blood in a basin, a big ass bucket. And this is what Leonardo had to say about what she did next with Faustina's body and her blood. Quote, I threw the pieces into a pot, added seven kilos of caustic soda, which I had bought to make soap. I stirred the whole mixture until the pieces had dissolved into a thick, dark mush that I poured into several buckets and emptied in a nearby septic tank. 
As for the blood in the basin, I waited until it had coagulated, dried it in the oven, ground it, and mixed it with flour, sugar, chocolate, milk, and eggs, as well as a bit of margarine, kneading all the ingredients together. I made lots of crunchy tea cakes and served them to the ladies that came to visit, though Giuseppe and I also ate them. End quote. Crunchy tea cakes? What the fuck? She fed them to the ladies in town, and she sent some to Giuseppe. Holy shit. Some sources say that Leonardo even got her hands on Faustina's life savings as payment for her matchmaking services. About 30,000 liar. Oh my god. Now, I don't know. I guess Leonardo thought, the more people I sacrifice, the safer Giuseppe will be. So she was not done. Her second victim was Francesca Salvi, who came to Leonardo for help to better her prospects. She was looking for a job. Leonardo told her that she found her a great job teaching at an all-girls school in Piacenza. Francesca was super excited for this incredible opportunity. So when Leonardo instructed her to pre-write letters to her friends and family about how great her experience in Piacenza is, she didn't question it. And just like Faustina did before her, Francesca went to Leonardo's one last time to drop off her letters so Leonardo could send her on her way to Piacenza. They toasted with wine. And when Francesca succumbed to the drugged wine, Leonardo killed her with the blunt end of an axe and repeated everything that she had done to Faustina to Francesca. Tea cakes and all. The payment for her job placement services was 3,000 lire from Francesca's savings. Holy shit. Just a few weeks later, Leonardo's third and final victim came to her easily because Leonardo had such a great reputation and she was helping all the ladies in town. So Virginia Cacioppo came into the shop to see if she could get Leonardo to help her too. Now, Virginia was a very successful singer. She had performed at La Scala, an opera house in Milan. And Leonardo told her that she had a great job opportunity for her because a mysterious impresario from Florence was looking for a new secretary. And Virginia's experience as a soprano would make her perfect for the job. And for those of you like me that didn't know what the hell an impresario was, he was basically a producer for operas and plays. Again, like the others, Virginia was instructed not to tell her friends and family of her plans and to pre-write letters to her loved ones to give to Leonardo. And Leonardo told Virginia to come back to her house when she was ready to go to hand off her letters and so Leonardo could send her on her way. That evening when Virginia came to Leonardo's transpired just like with the other two victims. But not only did Leonardo turn Virginia into crunchy tea cakes... But she also took advantage of Virginia's soft and slightly rotund figure to make some artisanal soaps, saying, quote, She ended up in the pot like the other two. Her flesh was fat and white. When it had melted, I added a bottle of cologne. And after a long time on the boil, I was able to make some most acceptable creamy soaps. I gave bars to neighbors and acquaintances. The cakes, too, were better. That woman really was sweet. End quote. Fuck me. And not only did Leonardo get a large payment from Virginia of 50,000 lire, but she also was gifted some assorted jewels. So she was really getting her bag. But unfortunately for Leonardo, Virginia had a sister-in-law that she was very close with. All three victims had been carefully chosen by Leonardo because they were a little bit older ladies with no husbands and what, who she thought had no close family and friends. But Leonardo didn't know that Virginia and her sister-in-law spoke very frequently before this mysterious job offer in Florence from this impresario. So Virginia's sister-in-law thought this whole thing was super suspicious and she did not buy these letters that showed up saying she suddenly moved to Florence and that everything was great. Like, there was no way that Virginia was not going to tell her sister-in-law about this before she left and then just not contact her again? Mm Mm-mm. No way. She wasn't buying it. She also wasn't buying these letters that showed up because there was no return address. Mm Mm-mm. Now, the sister-in-law knew that the last place Virginia had gone to was Leonardo's because Virginia had told her that Leonardo was helping her out with something. So the sister-in-law decided to contact the authorities and let them know about the letters and let them know that Leonardo was the last person Virginia was seen with. The authorities quickly began investigating Virginia's disappearance, and pretty quickly they realized that all signs pointed to Leonardo. Leonardo at first denied any wrongdoing, 
But the authorities very cleverly then shifted gears and started blaming Giuseppe for the women's disappearances to rattle her up. And it worked. And immediately Leonardo just gave a full confession. To protect her favorite son, Giuseppe, she blurted out, okay, I killed her and I killed those other two broads too. Leonardo's trial was pretty quick and it concluded in 1946. And she was found guilty of committing all three murders. And her sentence was eerily just as the palm reading fortune teller had predicted. And Leonardo was sentenced to 30 years in prison, followed by three years in a criminal asylum. In your right hand, I see prison. In your left hand, I see a criminal asylum. That's pretty fucking weird. Leonardo made it through her entire sentence and made it to the asylum. She was almost done. But she died on October 15th, 1970 at the age of 76, after suffering from cerebral apoplexy, which I think is basically a brain aneurysm and stroke. Many of the artifacts from this case, like the pot that she used to boil her victims and the blood basin, were sent to the Criminology Museum in Rome. You used to be able to go see the artifacts on display, but it appears that the museum has since closed. And I don't know what happened to all the stuff after that. Their website says that the museum is temporarily closed for maintenance, But nobody's updated that since 2016, and other sources says it's closed for good. So I'm sorry, you cannot go see the pots and pans and blood basins. In 1977, director Mauro Bolognini made a horror comedy film about Leonardo called Gran Bolito, or Black Journal in English. And there was also a dark comedy play called Love and Magic in Mama's Kitchen that did a brief stint on Broadway in 1979. So... And that is completely bonkers. What do you think? Do you think Leonardo was a stone cold killer? Or do you think she was just incredibly superstitious and really believed that if she sacrificed these women, it would protect her children? Pretty wild. And that's it. That is the story of Leonardo Cianciula, the soap maker of Correggio. We couldn't have done better with that name. Can't we get the crunchy tea cakes in the name somehow? I don't know. But let me know what you think about this story. I love the older ones. Be sure to leave me a comment and let me know what you thought of the story today. If you liked this video, give me a like and don't forget to subscribe because I'll be back next week with a new episode of Cleaning in Crime. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.